Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Major General Thomas R. Temple, Jr., the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Regional Health Command Central and the Chief of the U.S. Army Dental Corps. The Regional Health Command Central is one of four geographic commands in the U.S. Army Medical Department. The Regional Health Command Central is the largest geographic command and covers from Louisiana to Minnesota in the east and Southern California to Idaho in the west. It includes 14 subordinate commands, including 12 hospitals and outpatient clinics, as well as the Dental Command Central and the Public Health Command Central. The command provides care for more than 440,000 military beneficiaries and in 2016 delivered 5.8 million clinic visits, 7,600 live births, and 57,000 admissions. Major General Temple is a third-generation member of the Army Medical Department. He entered active duty in 1991 as an Army dentist, serving with a variety of operational units, including the 1st Special Forces, and commanded the 464th Dental Company while deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He later served in a series of leadership roles, including the commander of the U.S. Army Dental Command and the commander of the Western Regional Medical Command before coming to his current role. I really enjoyed talking with Major General Temple about his unusual career. We conclude with a brief discussion about his leadership philosophy, but I think you will get a sense of the kind of leader he is throughout the interview. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. Thanks for listening, and here is Major General Temple. Welcome to the Forge, General Temple. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the Forge. You earned a Bachelor of Science at Gettysburg College. What drew you to Gettysburg, and what did you study? You know, I, I appreciate you asking. It's a great story, actually. The uh, I, I was an Army brat growing up and graduated from high school in Würzburg, Germany, so I was unable to visit any colleges. So what I kind of relied upon were my two interests at the time were biology and swimming. And so I wrote letters to two people at a bunch of different schools, the biology professor, and also the swim coach. The only school that wrote me back a handwritten letter was Gettysburg College. And so that was truly my main criteria for selecting Gettysburg. However, I did. I also knew about it because I grew up in Maryland, and the church that the school was affiliated with was also was, was Gettysburg. So I had known about it from friends growing up and just seemed like a perfect fit. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, now going through that with my daughter, who's a was when she was a senior in college, she also wrote a bunch of letters to schools. And when she got her acceptance letters, the only school that wrote her back, it customized, it wasn't handwritten now anymore, but it was, it was personalized was the school she chose in Florida. So I thought it was really interesting how I could draw that parallel uh, with my daughter. Well, that's nice. And you said you studied biology? I did. Yeah, I was majored in biology, but I was also an ROTC, not under contract the first couple of years, but that, that came later. And did were, did you pick biology because you knew you wanted to go to dentistry at that point, or, or was that something that came later? No, I did. I, uh, I knew I was interested in dentistry, um, you know, early in high school. And uh, so, you know, a biology major at the time. It, Gettysburg is a liberal arts school, fantastic school, but you had, I had to have to get all the prerequisites from dental school. I had to choose one of the sciences, and biology interested me the most. And you mentioned you were an Army brat. And you became, and you got involved with ROTC. Was uh, your interest in ROTC because of of uh, growing up around the army? You know, I, I think absolutely. So, you know, I, I I didn't. We didn't have scholarships at the time when I was in college for for dental school. So, I, you know, I, to me, signing up for ROTC was something I was interested in, and there was no commitment early on. So, I figured I would try it, and if I liked it, continue. You know, I, I just signed up for it as a class. And I uh, didn't apply for the scholarship until after my about the middle of my second year. I really, really enjoyed it and the people I was working with. And, you know, I, I had some amazing TAC officers, you know, one of which I still keep in touch with today. And so I applied for the scholarship. My uh, 
my, I'm sorry, my second year and got a two year ROTC scholarship. And, uh, it's funny when I look back on that time because those, those, those officers and NCOs involved in the ROTC program were so dedicated and they really had a big influence. We had a captain, Captain Hartman, who was, was a, uh, a ranger in Vietnam. We had a Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Pernsley, who was S, a Special Forces NCO in Vietnam. And then our attack, our, our uh, professor of military science, Lieutenant Colonel Dombrowski, was also a veteran. And they, they just taught me so much. They pushed me hard, but they had a lot of common sense in the way they approached things for, uh, for college students. And so I, I applied for ROTC, uh, the scholarship, and got it. And, you know, the rest is history. But as as I talk later on in my career about some of the things I did, those, those folks are were very influential. And the neat thing is, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dombrowski retired, but is was still teaching. Was is just absolutely dedicated to teaching, and was a professor for the distance education at the Army War College. So when I was a student at the War College, I ran into him in the halls, and uh, it was just great to see him. Nice. And I. I reached out recently and he's still teaching to the ROTC students at Gettysburg College and all the schools that are affiliated with the ROTC program. So to me, I think initially started off because there was, I was interested, but the, uh, clearly the values that I grew up with, which, you know, we, we didn't call them, we didn't call them the, loyal, the leadership like we do now or the loyalty, duty, response, all those. Mm-hmm. We didn't call it the same thing, but clearly those values are what I was attracted to. And, you know, another, another neat story is, I guess that's what happens as you get older and you have ch- children now going through the same things. When I took my daughter to college, there was an ROTC program that she didn't sign up for, but we stopped by the uh, office and, and it was just incredibly evident, the values at which those dedicated folks apply to the uh, training the kids and, and also welcome my daughter you know, anytime she wanted to come by and visit and talk, they were there for her. So it just tells me what kind of family the Army really is. And speaking of family, your, so you mentioned you were a Army brat, and your father was an Army dentist while, while you were growing up. Is that, that's correct, right? That, that's correct, yep. So was, it, was your interest in dentistry from kind of growing up around that and, and your father's in, influence? It, it definitely was. And, you know, I, I'm... I'm feel extremely fortunate. I had a, a father and a grandfather who both served in the military. And, you know, my grandfather was a physician and was a pulmonologist, did a, served in World War II as a hospital commander in the Tinian Islands and did a lot of research in tuberculosis and different things. And so, you know, while I never was old enough to talk to him about the war before I passed, I certainly got to talk to him about the Army. And every time we'd go visit, we would go raise and lower the flag at his uh, retirement home. And then, then my father, who you know, obviously served a career as an as a army officer, and uh, I just watched how much he loved his job. But I also watched the incredibly positive interactions he had with his team, and how team oriented the Army Dental Corps was. And so that, along with you know my my love of working with my hands and and things like that, I chose dentistry as the uh, career, and and have loved every minute of it. So you went to dental school at the University of Maryland um, immediately after graduation. You knew you wanted to be a dentist. Did you know you wanted to be a dentist in the Army at that point? You know, I, I, I did, but that part of that was because I had a two-year ROTC scholarship, okay. so I knew after dental school I was going to come in the Army. Okay. But, you know, at that point, there, we didn't have the health profession scholarship, so, you know, it was going to be come in and fulfill my ROTC obligation. That did change after my uh, third year of dental school. They brought back the health profession scholarship, so I did apply for it. But, you know, I, 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 knew, I knew I was going to come in for a few years. And so, as you said, you, you grew up around dentistry, so you ha- had a pretty good idea of what that would be like. Was there anything that surprised you, and, and not necessarily in a negative way, about dental school itself when you actually got there? I would say absolutely. And so I've been married for 26 years to my wife from Baltimore. Uh And uh, so I never expected to go to dental school and find my wife. Uh And But I I met my wife, Kathy, who was a dental hygienist working at the school. She was actually uh, finishing her degree. She had a a registered dental hygiene degree, but she wanted to get her bachelor's degree. So she was working at the school doing several jobs, but also taking classes with the dental students. So we were in a couple classes together. And then 
she was also a clinical instructor for radiology, so she taught all the students how to take x-rays. Yeah. And then I, I, I give uh, my pharmacology department uh, chairman a lot of credit for this one. We, I was doing research you know, for, on the side with the pharmacology department, and they put my wife and I on a project together. And so we spent a lot of time working on, on these research projects and uh, just got to be really close friends. And uh, the rest is history for 26 awesome years. Well, that's, that's a neat story. A question I like to ask clinicians when I talk to them about uh, is about clinician their clinician identity. So, being a dentist um, is, is an important part of a person's identity. When did you kind of look in the mirror and, and say, you know, I, I really am a, I, I've made it. I am I really am a dentist. Was it when you you know walked across the stage you know at graduation, or was it sometime after that? You know. Um, <laughs> And I, honestly, I, I thought a lot about that question. And, you know, I, I think it was even before that, though. And so, of course, I won't use the pun about looking in a mirror because that's what we do as a dentist all the time. But uh, <laughs> the, the first time I seated, the first time I seated a patient, and this is in dental school. And, you know, as, as a dentist, you're you are awfully close to your patients and everything you do, you're staring in their eyes and their mouth. And, and it's complete trust. You know, you are truly, their health is truly in your hands. You know, the majority of what we do are surgical procedures. And so, you know, as we, as we work on the patients, there's so much to be learned from looking in their eyes. And so the, you know, the first, the first procedures are very simple when you start dental school, but whether you're just giving anesthesia, making models of somebody's mouth or, or doing a, you know, a filling, you're looking in their eyes and you realize that, you know, they kind of have complete trust in you. And at that point, I realized, wow, there's a lot of responsibility here, but um, what an awesome opportunity. So you graduated and came on active duty in 1991. Uh, something that was rather unusual about that is that your father was the commander of the U.S. Army Dental Command at the time and was a major general when you entered active duty, which is the rank you hold today. What was it like coming into an organization where everybody you'd be working with would have known who your father was? It must have been a lot of pressure. <laughs> so that, that's, that's certainly what it seems like. And looking back, you know, but I, I tell you, I'm, I'm very proud of my father. And he worked really hard, uh, but he maintained balance. He always cared for his people and spent a lot of time with my brother, sister, and, and my mom. So, you know, I'm certainly very proud of what he was able to achieve with the balance he also achieved. And um, so, I, you know, while looking back on it, it would certainly make sense to think there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. But to be honest with you, I never felt any pressure. And, okay. you know, I, I never had a goal to be a general officer. That's for sure. Um, I just wanted to be the best dentist and officer I could be. You know, so I, I did after ROTC and dental school, I did a residency, which I guess we can talk about. But yeah, from that point on, I took a very different path than my father. And so, you know, my father and my grandfather were both very involved in, in academics and research, and, and I, I went the much different route and, and spent most of my time with operational units early on, in particular special forces units. And so in those units, they frankly had no idea who my father was, okay. and, uh, and all that really mattered in those units is, is how I supported them and my proficiency and competency. And, uh, you know, so it was, it, was, it was very refreshing, but I'll tell you, over the years, you know, especially after my dad retired, th there were so many times when I would meet people that knew my father and they just talked about how, you know, how much he cared about him and how well he took care of him. And, and to this day, every time someone tells me that, I'll either text him a picture of uh, the two of us to my dad or, or if he comes to visit, I'll, I'll link him up with old friends. And it's just so great to see how those relationships have maintained over the years to include some of those that were uh, over 50 years old. And and my father, his first duty assignment in, uh, well, after his residency was in Germany with 8th, 8th Infantry. And my chief of staff now, Colonel John Lamro, his father-in-law at the time, Captain Wall, was served with my dad in 1963. And they saw each other for the first time and, uh, you know, over this, over holidays. And it was as if time stood still. It's the neatest thing and it's the best validation about this career and, uh, and the relationships you build, uh, based on trust. And we were chatting before before we started recording about you know people you and I have in common. It is a neat thing that the you know, the army shares. But you mentioned so when you came on active duty, you did a you did a residency, an advanced education in general dentistry. What is that? 
Yeah, these, these are incredible programs that uh, all three services, the Army, Navy, and Air Force have. And it, it, it's a one-year internship. When you graduate dental school, the majority of states allow you to just open up a dental practice. Some states are now starting to require a one-year internship prior to getting your license. But the Army, I, w- I wish we had enough for every single person coming in the Army, but we have about 50. And what you do is you spend a year spending time in each of the disciplines, have incredibly dedicated faculty, most of them are board certified, that will spend time teaching you their trade. And the, the neat thing about this opportunity is it really it really is a significant improvement to readiness of us as a healthcare provider to work in an austere environment. So it is it's an amazing opportunity to gain further skills. You you don't get the skills of a specialist, you know, per se, but you really understand your limitations and you have a much higher proficiency level than had you just gone into practice. Can you give an example of uh, you know what you mean by specialties? Yes. So by specialties, what we do is we spend we spend a certain amount of time in oral surgery. So we, we work side by side with the surgeon working on more complex cases than you would normally write out of dental school. You work with periodontists doing gum surgery and different procedures. You work with endodontists doing root canals. And all the procedures you're doing under their, under their leadership is far more advanced than you would normally do at, or you would be privileged to do uh, had you not done one of these programs. So, as you mentioned, after you completed your residency program, you went to the Detachment Officers Qualification Course for Special Forces and joined the 1st Special Forces Group Airborne as the dental surgeon at Fort Lewis, Washington. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and, and, and specifically, what does a dental surgeon do in the 1st Special Forces Group? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And you know, when, when I was in ROTC, the influence I had there was a uh, major, a captain who was a ranger and a sergeant major who was a special forces NCO. And when we when we did our training in ROTC, I can assure you they made it as realistic as possible in a training environment. And so we'd go on patrols in the battlefields of Gettysburg, not what most college students were doing in the Battle of Gettysburg, but we were laying there in uh, anticipation of an ambush that never would come in the pouring rain. These guys gave us very realistic training, and I had tremendous respect for them. Then when I when I went to, in college, my third year, I went to airborne school at Fort Bragg prior to the summer camp, and seven special forces group were the instructors for the course. Mm-hmm. And I, I really gained an appreciation for the professionalism of the special forces soldiers, you know, not just with their mission of direct action and other things, but also what great trainers they were. And, and that really got me interested because I talked to some of them, during the downtime, and they told me about some of the missions they got to go on. So when I was here at the officer basic course, or what's called Bullock now, I met a bunch of 18 Bravos, Special Forces Weapons Sergeants, who were reclassifying to be medics. And talking to those guys in the gym and other places, they told me a lot about what, what they do and, and how their medical teams and how their chaplains and veterinarians support them on different missions. And it was then then I was for sure that's what I wanted to do. They also told me, and I met a, a couple of physicians that were able to go through the Special Forces course, So, I, and they, they kind of pushed me in that direction. So through contacts that they were able to link me up with, I was able to get a date for the Special Forces Assessment and Selection, or SFAS. And so at the time, we um, we weren't able to, they, they didn't have fence slots for healthcare providers, but I was able to get a slot and the, my dental core branch said, sure, you, you can go. If you make it through selection, then you can go to the Q course and, you, you know, you're going to first group next summer regardless. So there's no recycles. And that to me seemed like a pretty, pretty awesome opportunity. So I went through the SFAS was a, was a significant physical uh, gut check, but it was really mostly mental because they didn't have to yell at you and scream at you. They just pushed you until you wanted to quit and uh, seed and uh, kind of witnessed what kind of teamwork you exemplified even when you were tired. So that was a tremendous opportunity. And then when we started the actual Q course, now, you, now you're working with a bunch of folks that are just um, had made it through selection and were en route to becoming Special Forces team leaders. And just, just an amazing opportunity, the last phase of which, called Robin Sage, is when you, you put together all the different SF MOSs and to include the officer and you work together as a team on, on, on a mission for six weeks. And it was just, it was an amazing opportunity. I learned a lot from all these 
uh, folks I was with, and then was able to go out to first group. You mentioned the, that. the you mentioned the the selection course. So this is not it, this is actually was two parts, right? You go to a selection course, and then you actually go to the Q course, the training. So you could have if you didn't make it through the selection course, you wouldn't have gone on to the to the Q course. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Okay. That, that's correct. So I, after after SFAS, I had a one month. So I did that in November, and then I I was reported. I had a month in between finishing SFAS and going to the Q course. So they just PCS me to Fort Bragg early, and I snowbirded with the third group in the surgeon cell for a month before I started the Q course. And how many people wash out of the selection course? What percentage? What percentage make it through? Maybe is a better way to say that. Oh, it was it was far less than half. Um, yeah. I I don't remember the exact numbers. It was pretty pretty close to about a third. Our formation was about a third the size of it was when we uh, first started SFAS. So this is a tough thing. I mean, I just want to I just want to highlight that this is not an easy thing that you you accomplished. Yeah. So, it, so was, yeah. it was one of the. I mean, it truly was a. You know, it was one of the things I'm very proud of in my career. Just you know, because it was it was physically extremely demanding, but you know, I. I I wouldn't have gone if I wasn't in great shape, but it was really mentally um, is, is where I think a lot of the people that wash out just give up, and that, that wasn't that wasn't an option. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you did go to the first special forces group, um, and, and as a dentist. So what was your role? Um, you know, so when 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 I went to the uh, SF group, your role there is is, is two. Your number one role is you're responsible for readiness of that unit. You're responsible for, I was responsible to making sure these guys were ready to go. And, but then, you know, from a, you know, we, we measure readiness in dental categories, one, two, three, and four. Dental category one is perfect health. Two means you have some, some disease, but we don't anticipate it being an, causing an emergency within the next 12 months. Class three is you have a condition that, you know, we think in our best professional judgment, could potentially cause an emergency in the next 12 months. And then category four is we don't know because you're just missing your exam. So my number one job is to make sure the soldiers are ready to go. The next next part of it was to make sure myself and the medics were, were ready, medically ready. So they, they had the training they required to go and do their mission because they work in very austere environments. And so their level of medical training is higher than the average medic. And so I, I did a lot of dental training of our medics to make sure they were ready to go. And then the third part of my mission was to deploy in support of the Special Forces missions, whether that be, you know, a foreign internal defense where we provide training to local forces or uh, we go out in the communities and the underserved areas and provide care in support of their government's objectives and, and our government, obviously. So there was a tremendous opportunity. Now, you were relatively early in your career as a clinician, as a dentist, how much clinical time did you, did you get um, during that period? So you're doing... Oh, that's a great question. If I wasn't, if I wasn't deployed, and, and I would say we probably deployed four times a year for about six months or six weeks at a time, you know, and if I wasn't deployed, I was working in, in the dental clinic at, uh, and my first special forces group is at, at uh, Fort Lewis. So I worked at dental clinic number two at Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And uh, so if I wasn't deployed or, or preparing for a mission, I was there at the clinic taking care of uh, the guys. Okay. So you, you'd you had that opportunity to, to continue to build your skills and, and, and hone them. Uh, but, but then you were also periodically deploying to do these special forces missions. Uh, what did you learn about leadership in, in that in that experience? You know, that I tell you, that was so I thought I learned a lot about leadership in ROTC, a lot of le about leadership in uh, in the in the Q course. But working with the SF teams and uh, whether it was deployed when I was deployed with them or training with them, you know, I, I learned a ton. You know, and the number one thing is every single member on that team wanted to be the best at what they do. Um, they wanted to make everybody else on that team the best at what they do because you're really only as good as the weakest link. And, uh, and I found that to be true for what operators, for providers, or for staff that you work with. You know, they, they really want to make sure everybody's the best. I learned a lot about cross-training. You know, they, they, they were absolutely willing to share everything they knew about their specialty, whether they were a communication sergeant, a weapons sergeant, or, or the intel sergeant. 
they made sure everybody understood, you know, as, as much as they could about the missions they would do. But the, the other part of it was, you know, so fundamental to leadership is truly active listening. And these guys were fantastic at that. You know, as, as they built rapport in some very unique places, um, they were they were very active listeners. I also, you know, two other things that I kind of took from that experience was the role of the NCOs. On a team with 12 folks that I was lucky enough to work with, those were the most professional NCOs, and they were they were incredibly good at their job, but they would do anything for you. They they work so well together. So I really understood, you know, what, what NCOs do. And then the last thing was because their op tempo was so high, and this is this is back in 1992, or I'm sorry, 93 to 96, you know, we weren't at war at the time, but these guys were deployed a lot. And so the importance of a family readiness group was certainly driven home. And some of the some of the best lessons my wife and I both learned were, were from being involved in their uh, family readiness group. So whether you were on a on a team or in support roles, they invited you to participate in the family readiness group activities and truly cared for each other. So awesome, awesome lessons about leadership during that time. What is a family readiness group for people who are not familiar with the military? Sure. The, the family readiness group is a group of volunteers. And at the time, it was a volunteer spouse who would lead lead in support of the the families that remained back in in the garrison when your when the spouses were deployed so they they had they had all kinds of activities whether they be easter egg hunts or holiday parties or or just just opportunities to get together and educate the spouses on what the army is and be there for the young less experienced spouses to take care of each other and while maybe not solve their problems help them get the resources that they needed to work on the issues that they were faced with. A great, great opportunity. What kind of, so this is a pretty unusual assignment. What did you learn? So you, you told me you, you had a, a fair amount of time to be in the clinic, you know, doing traditional clinical clinical work and continue to work on your skills. But what kind of unique clinical experiences did you have uh, during this period that, you know, maybe you've carried forward? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. So, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the unique uh, clinical experiences and that helped me. There's, I guess, there's two ways to kind of think about that question. One is what kind of unique experiences did I have deployed? And we we went to some. Our first special forces is the South Pacific and Southeast Asia is the area of operations. So we were working some very remote places, and from a clinical perspective, that meant working with no electricity. You know, working out of a rucksack or a duffel bag with with flashlights, with uh, headlamps, and different things, and and also working with medics that you know you were you were also training to improve their readiness, and obviously with with clinical oversight. But they these teeth that you worked on, depending on where you were, you know, a lot of times it was just extractions, taking teeth out because there was such disease they couldn't be saved, and they were in pain. So the way you could do the most good was to was to take these uh, painful teeth out, and sometimes you, I, you know, we always had we always had members of the team that spoke the local languages, so we'd have translators, or we would just learn enough of the language to to get by. But I tell you, we I worked on some. This is where I really appreciated having a one year education, advanced education in general dentistry, because some of the teeth we had to take out were extremely challenging, to include having to move the gums back and, and cut the teeth in half in order to get them out. And had, having, if I hadn't had a one-year program, to try to do that in the field with battery-powered hand pieces and lights would have been, frankly, next to impossible. So some really unique uh, experiences clinically. But then, uh, then the other part of it is when you when you're working in a remote environment, you also have to be very cautious because we some of the missions we would be literally on in boats going from village to village around the islands. Uh, a couple, one example was in um, Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands. And so you, you might see these folks to take their teeth out, but you you know you wouldn't see them again. And so you had to you had to be very very careful um, with the procedures you did. And back then we did we we don't have X-rays in those kind of machines in those kind of environments too. So you had to be very cautious on what you would do and what you could wouldn't do to make sure that you wouldn't leave a patient worse than they were um, when you got there. So your clinical your clinical judgment was certainly honed by these uh, remote opportunities. You know, but there there's also a lot I learned, you know, about our profession and, and the contributions of military medicine to the to the diplomatic mission and to the people we got to interact with 
were you, you understood how these missions were originated from the State Department to our national objectives all the way down to the SF group operating them. And so we interacted with ambassadors and village elders and village chiefs. So the the understanding, the customs and courtesies of these areas and how important those were to mission success was was also an amazing lesson for uh, someone early in their career. I want to fast forward a little bit to 2003. You were the commander of the 464th Medical Company Dental Service. You were in this role for, for three years, including a year in Iraq, as the dental surgeon with the 44th Medcom. Uh, what does the 464th Medical Company do? How big is it? What kind of services does it provide? And what did it do in Iraq? So the 464th Medical Company Dental Services is it's an area support dental company. Our, our unit, there, at the time, there were two different size units. We called it the MF2K, which was consisted of 45 soldiers and 15 dentists. And then there was a MRI company, Medical Reengineering, I think, that had about 60 soldiers and, and 30 dentists. The real mission there was to provide emergency, comprehensive care, prosthodontic, and preventive services in the deployed environment. You know, now the new new companies, we have more more robust capabilities. We have periodontist also. And our, our job at the time was to provide the area support dental care in the southern half of Iraq. So we, we had 12 FOBs from Balad down to Camp Buka. We augmented the dental assets that became organic to some of the some of the brigades that were over there. And great, great mission. I worked for uh, Brigadier General Granger at the time, who was the commander of 44th Medcom, and it was we, you know, my my role as the MNCI surgeon was to support the planning and execution of the dental mission, and and to travel and you know help General Granger make sure the mission was being accomplished as it needed to be. Can you give an example of what kind of when you say you you were responsible for planning the dental mission? Can you can you expand on that a little bit? You know, what what does that mean? What does a dental mission look sure. like in um, Iraq? Yeah, when you when you look at the theater, you know you, you had to understand the patch chart and where the units where the units were uh, based out of where, what FOBs had organic dental needs, and so to ensure that the readiness uh, of the soldiers that were in that area of operations, we wanted to make sure there was dentists close enough that they didn't have to convoy. At the, you know at the time, the IEDs were getting this was early on, so the IEDs were getting bad, and, and you certainly wanted to uh, limit limit movement as much as possible. So. While you couldn't have a dentist on every single fob, you wanted to make sure there was dental support close enough to, to minimize the risk of uh, soldiers moving around. So we looked over the theater and had a had an idea of what units had dentists, where there was area support medical companies with dental assets or combat support hospitals with dentists, and then where where there was a high enough troop concentration. If the a cash would only have one dentist, and so would an area support medical company. So if there was a large population of soldiers, you would have to have additional dentists there to uh, take care of the uh, sick call. Now, was this your first time as a commander? I mean, you've been in the Army for a while as an officer, but was this your first command? Oh, it was. And, and you know, and that's a, that's a unique, that's a unique aspect of, that's a unique aspect of being a physician or a dentist. By the time you have your training, you know, we did, we haven't had, a lot of us haven't had the opportunity to be company commander or a platoon leader. So I was a lieutenant colonel and this was my first opportunity in uh, command. And what was that like then? It was, I, I loved every minute of it. You know, I think the the neat thing, since it was my first time in, in command, you know, I, I was able to go to the company commander's course. So obviously a lieutenant colonel going to the company commander's course, I was a bit senior than the other participants. But the the, the neat thing was you just couldn't let your ego get in the way because you're learning this stuff just like the guys next to you. I was I was able to get the uh, AMID pre-command course, the solo course, senior officer legal, and and the Fort Leavenworth pre command courses. So you know, I certainly had the academic background, but we, I didn't have the experience that others would have if you were a platoon leader or a company commander first. Mm-hmm. The the neat thing about this is, you know, another lesson. Even though it was my first command, I had great team. And a, a little side story: before coming into command, I was at the Human Resources Command, or what used to be called PERSCOM, mm-hmm. and. Sitting at the desk I had in the dental corps, I got a phone call one day from a medical service corps officer who was having a hard time getting in the pre-command course and asked if I could help. And, you know, we had extra slots, so I got him in. And that person was, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Bitterman. 
<laughs> who was ended up going to be the commander of the 212th MASH, okay. which and I was I was the 464 was in Landstuhl and the 212th was in Misau, Germany, just a few miles down the road. And uh, that relationship turned out to be incredible. We did a lot of training together as a MASH and a dental company, which was kind of unique at the time. But, you know, when, when you, you might as well train like you fight. And when we went overseas as a dental company, you know, we were never alone in a base. We always would partner with, with the area support comp- medical company or, you know, cash. And so being able to train with Dave Bitterman and, and those really turned out to be an incredible opportunity. And it really helped me understand that even though you're in command, you know, you, you have you have the network of peers that you can talk to, and whether it's the company commanders forum or, or just your uh, friends, it really was a help. I have to say, I worked I worked for Dave Bitterman when he was the DCA at Belvoir, and he has actually he has actually been a guest on the Forge previously. So, for folks who'd like to uh, know more about Dave, uh, he's I have a I have an interview with him as well. So uh, af- after your time with with the four sixty fourth you kind of made a transition to working in what the Army calls TDA units or units that don't deploy. So what people typically think of as hospitals and clinics. So you were, you were the commander after, after your time in the 464th, you were the commander of the Fort Meade dental activity. So you had, when you were with the, with the first special forces, you, you had said you'd had time to work in a dental activity, but now you are the commander of a dental activity. How big was the Fort Meade dental activity? How many, Dentists were working under you. Kind of, what was the size of the of the organization? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. So Fort Meade uh, dental activity. I, I don't have an actual. I can't remember the exact number of dentists. But what made Fort Meade very unique was we had we had two clinics at Fort Meade, but then you were also responsible for Aberdeen Proving Grounds, where they had a dental clinic in, in, in next to the hospital, Carlisle Barracks, which had a dental clinic, and Fort Dietrich, which had a dental clinic. So well, the actual Fort Meade installation was relatively small. It was it was very difficult because you had soldiers spread all over the place, and it was myself and our our first sergeant it was a uh, sergeant first class. So it's pretty 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 challenging to you know maintain contact with everybody and visit the clinics. And so the, the other challenge was it was uh, Fort Meade is the home of NSA, and that was that provides unique opportunities. But having just come from the war college, two, three of the brigade commanders that were as NSA were war college classmates. So that certainly helped with the relationships uh, needed to ensure the readiness of those folks um, back behind the fence at NSA. I see. What was it like making the transition from a deployed, deployable unit like the 464th to working in in a fixed facility like the Fort Meade Dental Act? You know, the, uh, there, there's... It, there are many constants, and, and you know, even even being in operational units, as you know, especially special forces units, there are certainly different ways that the soldiers interact with each other. There's a level of familiarity that might be a little different, using first names and such that, you know, wasn't wasn't the case in, in a TDA unit. But the, the the truth is, your number one priority, regardless of what unit you're in, was readiness. And so, if if that was the foundation of which you you know approached your job. It, there were so many similarities. The, the other, the other constant is, is taking care of your folks, and it, you know, so that while the, the mission was different, and the, the amount of time you spent in the field training was certainly different. What was important to me was to make sure we took care of the readiness and the mission, but we also didn't lose sight that we were army officers first, and so we army officers and NCOs and soldiers, and so we we did keep the focus on our wartime skills which hadn't been done at the unit in a little while. So it was, it was also a great opportunity. So I think there was a lot of common areas between the two. You mentioned that one of the challenges of leading the, the Fort Meade dental activity was the fact that it, had, it was kind of scattered around the region. But a- after you've completed your command of the dental activity, you went on to be the commander of the Northern Regional Dental Command. What was the scope of that organization? Yeah, so the Northern Regional uh, Dental Command that that was that was an um, that was a fantastic job because that that had basically from Washington D.C. up to Fort Drum, New York, I guess Fort Knox, Kentucky. Also, we we had many dental activities now that we had that we had the responsibility of supporting to make sure that they had the uh, training, the manning, and the equipping that they need to accomplish their mission. The the other really unique thing about that job at the Northern Region was that 
the at the time General Schoomaker, in a brilliant move, realized that you know as, as regional dental commanders, at some point in our our life cycle, we need to be developed to understand a broader level of the Army Medical Department than the dental field. So they developed readiness divisions, and he put the regional dental commanders as the directors of readiness divisions. Yeah. You know, in that job, he sat at the table with the regional medical commander, who was at the time General Holly Bowen and General Caravallo. Uh, at the northern region, and we we sat there as the dental commander, but also as the readiness director. So many of the most difficult challenges with the command were were personnel related and readiness related, and so that was that was our job. We had 21 people in our division, and we would we would work to solve the readiness and ensure the readiness of the uh, forces we supported. And so the scope, the, the geographic span of control was certainly a lot bigger than Fort Meade. But a lot of similarities to the, it, your, the aspects needed to uh, support the uh, spread out units. Yeah, so that's I, I wanted to kind of highlight that that fact that you know now you are leading an organization where you can't just jump in the car and drive you know even you know drive across town. It's a it's a possibly a you know get on a plane to to put boots on the ground. <laughs> And uh, so how did your leadership have to change? What did you, how did you change the way you approached leading when you couldn't physically necessarily be there to physically oversee the organizations that you were in charge of? You know, there, it's interesting too, because, you know, when, when I think about going from, you know, from every level, whether you're an OIC to a DENTAC commander to a regional commander, the, there, there's a couple other things is you, you understand that the role of mentorship is is absolutely essential in, in all of those jobs. And it, it's how do you do it? You know, so, you know, you, you'd love to have face-to-face encounters with everybody that you're a raider or a senior raider to, but now because of the geographic dispersion, you, you just can't do it. But I'll tell you, one of the best lessons I learned was from General Granger. And he, we were in Iraq, and he actually was one of the first in my career to actually do the counseling as as is required by regulation, but actually do face to face counseling, and he could do that while we were in Iraq. And a lot of times for him, it meant as he was doing his battlefield circulation on a helicopter in Iraq, he would sit down with us and go through our support forms and make sure we were meeting our objectives and supporting the mission. And if he could do it there, there's no reason I couldn't do it in Fort Meade with places I could drive to, or in the northern region where a lot of those you know did require a plane flight. But you know, I, so you ask as as you go to a larger command. You know, there's certainly certainly some things that were a little different, and obvi- there's the obvious. You have a larger staff, but then the other part of it is, you know, and the you know emotions get you nowhere when when fighting for resources and trying to support your team. You know, having good data, good objective data, to help you make the deci- the right decisions, but also be good re- uh, stewards of our resources it is really important. You know, and I was really lucky in a recent course I got to go to where I met Theo Epstein, who is the general manager of the Cubs. And, you know, he's, he's also, the, the book Moneyball was written, and he, he highlighted how important using the right data, not just data, but the right data, and also, you know, putting your values prior, you know, even ahead of data if, if you think it's right. You know, so in his case, it's using the right data, but also, you know, making sure you have the right people on the team. So in, the, in those jobs, you know, making sure you have the, the data is important. The, uh, the, the role of collaboration is also really important and, and how you work with your team. You know, and, and this, in that job, it's the first time at the regional command, it's the first time I had a sergeant major and uh, just absolutely blessed with very experienced, very outstanding sergeants major. And the sergeant majors, you know, as we walked the terrain, they would get the pulse and they would see things differently than I did. And so it just highlighted the importance of starting every day and finishing every day, talking to your to your senior, your battle buddy, your senior enlisted advisor on what you saw and then that communication. So the, the challenge is, is how do you, what kind of battle rhythm do you establish to ensure that your commanders have open access 24 hours a day to you if they need coaching and mentoring, but also to ensure that your team, you know, your staff at your region is totally dedicated to supporting those subordinate units. And if, if that's the case, it certainly makes the job easier, but the mission much more effective. So after you, after your <laughs> command of the northern region, you actually became the commander of the U.S. Army Dental Command, the job that your father held when you first came on active duty, which we talked about earlier. And at the same time, you also were appointed as the chief of the Army Dental Corps. What was it like becoming the commander of the Army Dental Command? 
You know, so every every level, there's things that just bothered you fundamentally that you may not have had the big picture and you didn't understand why some things were the way they were. But each job offered, you know, gave opportunities to improve things that you thought needed to be improved. And so uh, when I left the region and I went to the Army Dental Command, probably when I when I think back to my early career, there, the the first commander of that was at the time Colonel Pat Scully became general, and then the second commander was Colonel Leo Rouse. And those those two officers, when I would come for training, you know, would get the officers together and just really fire them up about the contributions we make to Army medicine and the Army. And so if, if there was ever a job I aspired to in my career, it certainly wasn't becoming a general officer. It was always to be the commander of the Army Dental Command. And so getting that job was, was truly an incredible honor, especially with the folks that went before and the contributions they were able to make. And so at the time, there was there was a few things that really, you know, bothered me. And, and one of those was was our, our focus on readiness is obviously essential for the Army. But the fact that there was so much disease still present in the Army and, and we weren't really going after health, you know, was something that I thought that we could really improve. And so that's that was one of the things that I, w- I really look forward to going to the Army Dental Command was to support our regional commanders. And at the time also, you know, so I, I was the commander of the Dental Command for two years. And at the time, General Horaho was the commander and had had, an, had a vision that truly, you know, to me was one of the most inspiring, and that was to enhance the health of our nation by improving the health of our Army. And when you really think about that, that mission absolutely brought in to the team everybody in Army medicine to support, you know, the health of the nation. So, you know, we really felt part of the team, and we really looked at how, what can we do to help realize that mission. And, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the initiatives, I guess, in a little bit. But it was some really tremendous uh, opportunities in that role as the Army Dental Command. Just to, just to clarify, what, what, is this, what is the scope of the commander of the Army Dental Command? So, so at the time, the Army Dental Command, we had five regions, and we had all the dental activities from all the dental clinics from the Pacific to Europe to all over the country. It was a self-contained command for the most part. A lot of support that came from our medical treatment facilities because of the size, the small size of our dental activities. But we had the responsibility of developing all the policies and manning the force to uh, to make the mission happen. So it, it covered the entire globe and uh, was definitely an immense responsibility and, and very difficult to try. I mean, I, I, I never could make it to all of our dental clinics across the country, but certainly visited it with all the regional commanders pretty often. Now, one of the one of the programs that I wanted to ask you about was Go First Class. What was this program? So you know, when you looked at the way we delivered care, there was two things that I thought could be done better. And one was, was to improve, to actually go after improving health. And, you know, we, we traditionally, the dental class one had been around 20% almost all my career. And there had always been a, a goal of 65%. And so the, to me, if there's disease present, you know, as, as healthcare providers, there was a medical model. So rather than treat things surgically, let's see what we can prevent. So predict and prevent versus, you know, doing a surgical model was certainly something that was much more in line with our thinking. The other part of it was what was happening was a lot of soldiers, over half the soldiers that came in for their dental exams never came back for any further treatment, whether it be a cleaning, cleaning their teeth or having their fillings done. So half the soldiers would, would leave and their fillings, they would, wouldn't get them done, so they would just get bigger over time, many of them eventually becoming dental cast class three and, and needing root canals. So I, I, we, we thought there had to be a better way of, of providing the care. There was a, a pilot being done at Fort Bliss, Texas, I heard about, and they were, they were achieving great success by doing the exams and the cleanings in one visit. And, and then if they had small fillings, that was eventually added to the process. So what, what Go First Class really was, was the improvement in the process at which we provided the care. And by lumping your cleaning, your exam, and your filling into one visit, you know, we were able to save over, you know, if, if you did the math with the number of soldiers we served and, and you, you multiplied it by the time, the number of soldiers by the time it took to go, you know, to and from the clinic for your exam, to and from the clinic for your cleaning, and then if you needed a filling, to and from the clinic, you know, we were able to save over a million hours of training time and return that back to the line for their soldiers. And we, I remember the day very well when we briefed General Odierno on this concept, 
and what the possibilities were, but what, also what was required of the, the line soldiers. So rather than march a company in or a platoon to get their dental exams, you know, you, you now have to schedule your cleanings and your exams. But the outcomes with improving health could be dramatic as well as the improve, you know, re- return of time. And if you put a dollar amount to that, it's, it's a very significant dollar amount also. And, uh, so, you know, you ask about the difference going between a Dentec a region and a, and the Dencom. You know, the level of, uh, pressure, some of these decisions was, was significant, you know, significantly increased at each level. And when General Odierno said, absolutely, that's what we need to do, let's do it. To that point in my career, clearly the most pressure we've ever had. Now the entire army had to do that. And that was a tremendous undertaking. Luckily, I was able to ask the officer that was piloting the program at Fort Bliss to come to Fort Sam Houston. And this was done even before I took command of the dental command. And so he joined us in Fort Sam Houston, and he, and he really led the effort with our strategy and innovation team and, our, and became our operations officer to execute this uh, in a very deliberate, deliberately planned manner to go across the Army. Very successful, you know, when you, when you think of John Cotter's leading change and eight steps, the, uh, those, those were those were clearly articulated and, and executed according to his according to the plan. So I really I really his, his name was Colonel Brian Kalish. He's retired now, but you know the, the key the key outcome of that Go First Class program was to take the Army from about 20 percent dental category one to the entire Army now being over over six almost 65 percent. And it, when you look at the raw numbers, that's a huge number of soldiers that are now healthy. And to me, getting someone healthy, you're certainly much, it's, you're always ready if you're healthy, but you also, it's much easier, um, should you get called to deploy, you know, you're going to have less issues. And the dental, dental condition of soldiers has always been a challenge from, from early times and re- readiness, whether it's in Vietnam or Desert Storm, dental readiness was always a challenge. And so I'm really proud to take that next step, what the team was able to do to improve health and readiness. And hopefully, you know, dental readiness will always challenge. Um, will be less of a challenge the next time. And, you know, ju- just when you think that the oral health of our country is improving, and depending on what statistics you look at, you know, it is improving a little, but depending on, you know, what, what groups are coming in the Army, you know, that we still have almost 50% of the soldiers that come in the Army today have dental category 3 conditions. And uh, so it's, it's still a, a very significant challenge to maintain the Army ready to go. And that's not something you can let slide or it'll quickly degrade. And then, obviously, when you deploy, you'll have more dental emergencies keeping critical members of the team uh, out of the fight. In a nutshell, that might have been a long answer to what Go First Class was, um, but it's been a very successful program, one that continues to this day. So also during this period of time, you became the chief of the U.S. Army Dental Corps, a role you uh, continue in today. What is the U.S. Army Dental Corps why does the Army have a dental corps, and what do you do as the chief? So the Title 10 of U.S. law requires to have a, a dental advisor to the chief of staff of the Army uh, through the Surgeon General of the Army. So through the, the Title 10 responsibilities, any critical advice that is needed uh, from a dental perspective is, is my responsibility, as is the readiness of the force. You know, so on some of the, some of the uh, real issues we get faced with strategic communications, officer recruitment policies, health profession scholarship policies. Um, a big part of the job is the intra-service and interagency coordination. And, you know, now with the Defense Health Agency, that is a more critical role than ever. And I work very closely with the Air Force, the Navy, the Public Health Service, the VA, and the Coast Guard Corps Chiefs to ensure that our, our policies are all in alignment. And we also, you know, while I don't have uh, the Reserve Affairs uh, Office, is not under my um, authority. You know, we work very closely with the reserve component because many of the dental companies these days are uh, in the reserves. So that that's the in, in the short version of, of what we do. But you know, there's also a lot of amazing work that gets done uh, from the we oversee the graduate dental education as well as the research that's done through through separate commands. But the, those are all um, under under our guidance. the The other part of it is we execute this mission. Through the, we have a deputy corps chief at the office in Washington D.C., as well as the corps proponent that's here in San Antonio, and then also with our graduate, we have a chief of graduate dental education who's the dean of all of our residency programs here in San Antonio. So we work very closely with them, 
as well as the Army Proponents Division here in San Antonio to make sure our force modeling keeps the keeps the strength of our Corps in a sustainable uh, way uh, manner, as well as the office at the Human Resources Command, also under a different command, but we work very closely with them to make sure we manage our talent, which has been a very important part of my job, is to ensure we have talent, you know, not only uh, to support the dental mission, but we are sharing our talent from an enterprise perspective for those that have the potential and the desire to serve a broader role than just in the dental community. I wanted to ask you two quick questions about dentistry because your career kind of takes a bit of a turn at after your command at the DENCOM. So what do most people misunderstand in your experience about the field of dentistry? Misunderstand about the field of dentistry. You know, um, what do you, if, that, you to, a, if you go to a cocktail party, yeah, and, no, and, I, yeah, what do people, <laughs> and you have to explain, you know, what do people say that's just wrong or miss, you know? Sure. <laughs> well, first, I got to put in a plug for the field of dentistry. I mean, it, it yeah. was in, in U.S. News and World Reports, it's the number one job now. So, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly, it, it's a great profession. What I think people really misunderstand about the field of dentistry is, is, you know, it is it is a it is a system, you know, that's very different than the care that's provided in hospitals. We obviously have our oral surgeons work in hospitals, and some of our uh, maxillofacial prosthodontists, pathologists, and others that work in hospitals. But for the most part, dentistry is still an outpatient model. We don't work in hospitals, and you know, so the the systems of support for dentistry. Fortunately, we have a, a, a different record than we use in a medical record, and we are finally moving into the point where we're going to have an electronic dental record, which I'm very excited about, but the records are very different. However, uh, as a dentist, you know, what I think some people don't understand is, is the level of knowledge you receive in the four years of school, the, the first two years of which you know, are very similar to what medical students go through. So the understanding of the disease process is the knowledge of human conditions, pharmacology, and frankly, the complexity of oral diseases, you know, I think if some folks probably don't have an appreciation of. And, and, and in addition to just, frankly, the challenge of working in the oral environment, you know, and, and working when when your level of tolerance is hundreds of a millimeter, you know, for uh, for your fillings to and your crowns to fit up against the two, there, there's a lot of very um, tight constraints that they have to work in. But, um, but you know, people, people sometimes ask, how can you do that? And, and I will tell you, when you have big challenges, you also have incredible rewards. And when you have a patient who's been in, in pain for a significant amount of time or uh, didn't have function because of the way their teeth were aligned or, you know, the, the, the cavities there, um, it, it is very rewarding to return someone's function and their smile to enhance their, their abilities to do their job or just their self-esteem, you know. So great opportunities uh, in, in the field of dentistry. What do people misunderstand or not understand about military dentistry specifically? You know, um, I, I would say that they, I think many people look at the way healthcare is delivered on the installations and you have a dental activity and a, a, uh, and a, and a medical activity. And what they, I think they don't understand is how incredibly devoted the uh, dental leaders are to being team players in Army medicine and, you know, how closely they work in support of the, uh, of the Surgeon General's initiatives, and uh, and how closely they work with the with the hospital commanders. M- much of the support that comes to a dental activity, whether it's logistics, facilities, IT, much all that comes from the from the hospital. And so the relationships that are developed that has always been one of the highlights of my career is the people I've been able to work with to accomplish our mission. So in 2014, you left command of the Dencom and went to be the commander of the Western Regional Health Command. And I'm just going to, I'm going to fast forward that because now, and then in 2015, you became the commander of the Regional Health Command Central. So these are both regional commands, though my understanding is Western has now been kind of collapsed into a, there are fewer regions now. So if you don't mind, what I'd, what I'd like to do is maybe just move on to talk about your current role as the commander of the Regional Health Command Central. Sure. So what is the Regional Health Command Central? What does it do? You know, it's very very similar to the uh, Western Bowl. Started, uh, I started um, going again. We, we did the Army Medical Department transformation, and, and so the Western Regional Medical Command is, is very similar to the Regional Health Command Central. You know, we were a regional support 
and seven of the hospitals that were under Western Region are now under the Central. So it was a uh, you know very similar missions, uh, just different geographic locations and, and span of control. So the, the mission of a regional health command is to provide sustained health services in support of the total force to enable readiness and to conserve the fighting strength while caring for our own team. So that, that's really the mission, same mission of Western Region as it is in uh, Central. Great, incredible opportunity. What's the scope of the region? All right. So this this is a short question, but there's probably going to be a pretty answer. long answer. <laughs> um, but I, I'm really proud of this team, so I certainly want to highlight it. You know, to me, uh, the, well, the central region is, is really the Army's largest geographical medical region, which gives us the opportunity to impact more than 448,000 beneficiaries, which includes active duty soldiers, reservists, members of the Guard, retirees, and family members. So our command oversees the medical, dental, veterinary treatment facilities, including the non-veterinary public health facilities within the region. And I think you may know that the uh, veterinarians have, are the DOD executive agents, so there's a lot of missions that they do across the region, not just at Army bases, but at Navy and Air Force. Right. So we cover a geographic area, about 20 states across the south, southwest, and the midwest, ranging from Louisiana to the, on the east to California on the west. We have 12 military treatment facilities in the region, the Public Health Command Region Central and also the Regional Dental Command. So in addition to the 12 hospitals, we have two regional public health and dental commands that work with us. The Public Health Region Central is comprised, comprised of two public health activities, and within each of those activities are veterinary clinics at each base. You know, And as I said, our, it's not just Army, but as well as in environmental health and industrial hygiene offices. And then the regional dental command, they uh, they have 43 dental clinics just across our region, and they're also we're also home to the Warrior Resiliency Program, which focuses primarily on the mission of virtual health within the region and between the different MTFs. They also administer the regional suicide reduction initiative, which includes epidemiological tracking and review of the suicides, as well as the provider training to ensure that the latest evidence-based assessment and uh, intervention strategies are used. So just just a few statistics, if you want them, in, yeah. in 2016. On the outpatient side of care, we had over 5.8 million clinic visits, 7,600 live births, more than 7.9 million lab procedures, more than 6.5 million outpatient prescriptions filled, more than 1.6 million radiology procedures, and over 1.7 immunizations administered, administered. And then for inpatient care, we have 1,360 operational beds and more than 57,000 patients who were admitted. And our dental teams handled more than 2 million dental procedures. And then our veterinary services had more than 87,000 outpatient visited visits and inspected $3.9 million worth of food and conducted more than 21,000 food safety visits. So, I, you know, you certainly see by numbers that we're busy, but it's also a very broad mission, um, one that, I'm really proud of our uh, headquarters uh, supporting. That's a that's a remarkable set of statistics you shared. So looking at your headquarters, what does that organizational structure look like? Who is your team that helps you kind of oversee all this this diverse set of responsibilities? Sure. And you know what? I'd love to give I'd love to give you every single person's name because uh, right. <laughs> uh, we have such a good team. Yeah. But the uh, you know, that's, clearly that's... the folks I work most closely with include my deputy commanding general Brigadier General Jeff Johnson, who is also the commander of Brook Army Medical Center. We're unique in this region as our DCG is also a commander. And so his main focus, in addition to his command, which is the primary responsibility, is the readiness in our region. Our chief of staff, Colonel John Lamoureux, and my command sergeant major, Tabitha Gavia, make up our uh, our team. And as well as, because this mission is uh, so spread out, our regional dental commander, Colonel Mike Roberts, and our public health command, uh, Commander Colonel Gene Bardo are the ones that I, I work with every day. I've also got a team of assistant chiefs of staff at the headquarters building handling the day to day operations of a command headquarters and our, our SGS, a Secretary of the General Staff, Don Keeler, and our Secretary Denise. And I could go on and on and on about the amazing people we have. Okay. Um, you know, we have the, the typical um, G staff uh, with the one, three, four, six, nine, and, uh, to, you know, to make up the uh, headquarters and accomplish the mission. Yeah, the, these, for folks that don't know, that's personnel, operations, logistics, so on. 
So, exactly. Well, Thank I, you. I, I, I know that, <laughs> having been around it, but a lot of folks that will listen to this are not familiar. So right. how does the regional structure add value to the subordinate organizations? How do you know that your headquarters is, is improving the ability of the organization to function? Yeah, that, that's, you know, to me, that's, that is a, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a great question. You know, the, um, the, the, key, the key to, I think, answering that question is when you consider the span of control of the MedCom commander, and, you know, just, just like as the Army Dental Command, the span of control was enormous. The span of control of, the, of our, our Surgeon General is dual-handed as the MedCom commander. And so our, our job is truly to support those uh, subordinate, the two, regional dental and public health command, as well as the uh, medical treatment facilities. And so I think providing the coaching, the mentoring, you know, ensuring that our mission is in line with, with Army Medical, and then, you know, coordinating, coordinating with MedCom. We, we, have, we have the subject matter experts in all the fields, whether it's personnel, operations, facilities, or information technology to support our units. Another area where a lot of coaching and mentoring occurs is in the safety, quality management, equal opportunity, EEOIG, and especially at our um, director of communications and public affairs. You know, very essential that, you know, we have the true subject matter experts to support our medical treatment facilities and those underneath us to accomplish their missions. What is your role as the commander? What do you see as your primary function? You know, my, my primary function is to ensure that our, we are successful at our mission. And, you know, I, I truly look at my role as supporting our commanders to ensure they have everything they need to do their job. You know, while at the same time, our Surgeon Generals, you know, when, when you look at her mission, the uh, fourth fourth of, line of, of her lines of effort is taking care of each other. So, you know, while I'm certainly, certainly focused on the accountability and making sure we accomplish our met- metric, I'm also very focused on talent management and making sure we're taking care of each other. Uh, what does a day in the life of the commander of the region look like? All right, so I, you probably don't want to know how many hours I sleep or what time I get up to do PT. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, tr- truthfully, you know, I, I, I do take that very seriously. You know, one of the things that Army Medicine is has very, very ably done is talk about the performance triad where we understand the importance of sleep activity and nutrition. And so I will just tell you the day in my life is is focused on those three things too. So while I do my best to get you know, over six hours sleep, I do get up in the morning early and do PT and then start my day with a huddle with our team, with our command sergeant major and, and our key staff. And then and then what's important to me is is taking time every single day to get away from my desk and walk walk the halls and, and get to know our team. Of course, that's my own headquarters. I wish I could walk through each of the commands every day, but but that is also that is also important to me that we try to visit each of our commands at least twice a year. And so, my day is, is clearly spent. You know, executive time management is one of those skills that you have to learn as 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 you you go up through the different jobs, and it gets more challenging every day. But if you put your priorities on your calendar, you will they will happen. And so. You know, time management has been a, a real, a real challenge, but something I've been really put a lot of emphasis on to ensure that we, uh, that we, we give the time to our teammates that need it. What are the most important metrics that you monitor? If you, you know, had to pick just a couple. Yeah, sure. The, you know, the, the the number one when you when you think about the metrics that that we really track, you know, the readiness readiness is is clearly one, and uh, access to care is another. I guess when you think about those two metrics, they are they certainly work together very well. So you can't have readiness if you don't have access to care. So th- those are two two metrics. And when I say readiness, you know, I mean the readiness of the force that we support. But it's also really important to understand, you know, our own readiness. And so we have a so if if you are a provider or a, a soldier working in a clinic, you might be a professional filler to support a unit that could be going down range. We call that profis. And what's very important to me right now is that our folks that are profis are ready to go, not just with their medical skills, but also their soldier skills. And that, that's, a, that's a metric right now that's essential for us to be tracking. What keeps you up at night as the commander? So if you're laying in bed staring at the ceiling, what's, what are the things kind of that worry you the most? Yeah, no, that, that's certainly a great question. And while it might change a little bit over time, there's a couple constants. And uh, number one is really when you, when you think about profis, and you know, having deployed and, and 
you know, know, know what life is like, the, the potential to send someone overseas untrained is, uh, is certainly something that keeps me up at night. So making sure our profis soldiers not only know their profis, but have attained a level of proficiency as a soldier and a, and a, whatever their, their uh, duty MOS is, is, is really important. And it certainly keeps me up at night knowing that, you know, we got a lot of work to do on that. The other part of that is, is the safety of my team. And, you know, I, I think I'm really, really proud of the Army with the efforts that we've put forth in preventing suicide and also at preventing sexual assault. And, you know, when I take the uniform off in a few years, I know I'm going to look back on that and say, you know, if there was ever an organization that could get after those two really significant challenges, it's the Army. And, and I, I, so, you know, the safety of my team certainly keeps me up. Um, as well, right now, you know, we're undergoing a very unique time with the National Defense Authorization Act and the changes that will be coming in military medicine and making sure we get that right so the future, our future Army is as strong as it is right now is, is very, very important and certainly wakes me up at night with thoughts on how we need to, you know, work on that. What would you say you're most excited about in, ter- in looking into the future for, for either the regional command, Army medicine, or military medicine in general? You know, I, I, I tell you, and being here in San Antonio and getting to sit down with every single officer that comes through the Captain's Career Course and, and seeing the quality of people coming through Bullock and through our NCO courses and, and knowing the quality of civilians I have in this headquarters, I am incredibly excited about the talent we have um, to lead this organization into the future. And, you know, so one just one example of that is, you know, when when – when you have a selection process, you're going to get a, a, a higher level of folks. So, you know, a selection to get in, I'll just use dental. I'm very familiar with the dental school. You know, when you have sometimes 18 applicants for every slot to get into dental school, you're getting an incredibly high caliber individual to even get into dental school. And then when you have the scholarship, those that get the scholarship, which is almost all the uh, sessions we bring in, another selection process. So the quality of quality of people we are bringing into the Army, I am absolutely confident, are going to lead the Army, regardless of all the changes that are forthcoming. You know, this this team is going to lead the Army to be as successful and have the same impact on uh, battlefield casualties as we've had in the past. I'm, I'm very excited about that. I wanted to ask you a few questions about leadership to close up the interview. Could you tell us what your leadership philosophy is? You know, it, and it, it's pretty simple. And I, I know, you know, I, as, as I, it's kind of funny, I was actually talking about this with my Sergeant Major today um, as we were coming back from lunch, and she said, sir, that sounds just like McChrystal, and uh, his philosophy is listen, learn, and lead, and, and you know, I, I love the simplicity sometimes of which the smartest people think, so, you know, I would have probably given you a two-hour answer, but it could have been answered in three words, um, you know, but the the reality is, you know, you need to listen. And, and I'm not talking about just the dynamics of active listening when you're one-on-one with somebody and you're not distracted by cell phones or other things. I'm talking about listening to all the cues that you have. So whether it's your your boss's mission and vision or it's those around you that are, are um, offering advice, you know, you really need to listen. And then you need to learn. You can never let your ego get in the way of learning. You know, if you think because of the rank on your chest, you know, you're beyond the point where you can learn and listen. You will not be near, anywhere nearly as effective as a leader. And, and I'm surrounded by brilliant people here, and, and I recognize it. And I, I feel incredibly fortunate because the, the people that work in my headquarters and those that we support, they're the ones that are going to have the answers to the tough challenges. Just like Go First Class was developed in the, in the outline clinics of Fort Bliss, Texas, you know, the, the great ideas and those that are in the trenches are going to be the ones being most creative to solve the uh, challenges. And so you have to listen and you have to learn from them. And then you have to lead. You know, you have in, in the leading. The leading is is essential. And I, I one of my favorite books ever is is by uh, Kim Cameron, and it's on positive leadership. And through positive leadership, you can you can achieve extraordinary results in your organization. And so I, I feel very fortunate to have grown up with very positive role models in my family, but also early in my career and had those leading. So, you know, leading as a positive leader, as a servant leader is very essential to the uh, thing. But at the same time, one of the things that makes our army the, the best is the professional NCOs that we get to walk side by side with every day. And then realizing that, and, uh, you know, every time I get the opportunity to talk to young officers, 
I said, you know, one of the first stops you make when you go to your new clinic better be to the NCOIC because that is truly our, our clinic managers, our NCOICs um, are tremendously experienced leaders and they will help accomplish your mission if you, if you trust and you, you uh, work with them. And then the, the last part, which we didn't get to really talk much about, is, is mentorship. And, you know, I've, I was, you know, I've always used the definition of mentorship being it's a long-term relationship built on mutual trust and respect. And those mentorship relationships are always going to be much more successful when the officer being mentored or the mentee is the one that seeks it out. And uh, I've been really lucky to work with some incredible people over the years and, and have had mentors that have been very valuable in making career decisions, whether they be next jobs or career decisions and, you know, to solve specific problems. And I believe everybody's potential is significantly enhanced if they have active mentors um, in their careers. What advice would you have for early careerists who aspire to lead a healthcare organization, uh, perhaps a large system like, like the Central Region someday? To me, early on, every task you're given, give it the best you absolutely can. Seek collaboration with those you work with, you know, and, and keep all your doors open. I've all, I think focusing on relationships at every single level will make everybody, to include you, much better. Give them the credit for the work they do. Recognize your people. And, and frankly, you know, one of the old adages is they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, at every single level, whether you're a platoon leader or a regional commander, you know, those are really important. Those are really important aspects. You know, so no matter how much you know, really truly caring for your people is, is very, is important. And, you know, when, when I look for leaders to select to join my team, you're going to find all kinds of incredible folks. They have all the statistics. They've done all the jobs. But when it comes right down to it, you know, having someone that has the capacity to be nice to people, you know, will certainly help build the kind of team that I want to uh, lead this organization and support our commanders. And so keeping those things in mind, I think, along with having true mentors, I think is essential, you know, as you, uh, as you look at a career in, in healthcare. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. This has been great. I really appreciate this, this time and, 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 you know, sharing, sharing thoughts with, with other leaders. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you in the future, let me know. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.